Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this semester, semester's final Friday SLO talk of the fall 2023. We are calling this the grand finale, a forum dedicated to discussing, questioning, and expressing views on the assessment of student learning in higher education. Before we dive in, I want to remind you that Friday SLO talks are forums designed for a conversation. We encourage you to actively participate. If you wish to contribute to the discussion, please raise your hand, notify one of the coaches or send us a message. We'll make sure you have the opportunity to voice your thoughts. Chat is also a good venue to ask questions. As you settle in, we would appreciate if you could please introduce yourself, including your institution, city, state, country. My name is Yarek Yanyo. I'm the founder of Friday SLO Talks, and I'm here with my colleagues from the California Outcomes Assessment Coordinators Hub, or coaches. We are a team of higher education professionals passionate about student learning assessment. It's my pleasure to introduce you, introduce to you, first of all, my colleagues as they appear on my screen. Um, Amanda, please. Good morning. I am Amanda Tainter. I'm the faculty coordinator of instructional design and outcomes at Reedley College in the Central Valley of California. Enrique. Good morning, everyone. My name is Enrique Howardy. I'm the SLO coordinator for Fresno City College, uh, right in the Central California and sister of Reilly College. Uh, Danny. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Danny Pittaway. I'm a full-time faculty member at Coastline College, and I'm also the um, Student Learning Outcomes Coordinator and the Student Success Coordinator. And how about Benny? Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Benny Ng. Uh, I'm a full-time faculty member at Los Angeles Pierce College, and I'm also the College Outcomes Coordinator and Instructional Excellence Specialist uh, here at Pierce College. Nice to see everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much, coaches. This is our collaborative work. So again, I'm just I'm just go so so grateful uh, that we get to collaborate and 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 work on those Friday talks. It's it's just been a, a, a tremendous journey of 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 learning and collaboration and networking. Great experience. Thank you. Thank you, Errol. Today's discussion will follow a structured format uh, with a set of questions that will serve as conversation starters, presented by coaches to our panelists. This semester, we've engaged in rich conversations about the influence of artificial intelligence on higher education, covering instruction, assignments, assessment, competency-based education, challenges in the assessment process. Central to our discussions have been student skills and competency attainment as we explore artificial intelligence vast potential and the transformative possibilities it holds. However, these conversations have also uncovered numerous questions about AI's integration into our academic spaces. As we ponder the future of classrooms, lecture halls, assessments, and the nexus of teaching and learning, our next point of inquiry is how we prepare our students for the workforce. This is the rationale behind our panel's composition today. What makes today's event so special is that the panel members represent a unique mix of higher education professionals, assessment experts, and industry leaders. We are looking forward to the discussion. Thank you again to all panelists for agreeing to share their expertise with us. We welcome you to today's Friday SLO talk. And as you introduce yourself, please share with us the greatest question, challenge, problem, issue that you think is going to drive change in your field in the next three to five years. Again, as they appear on my screen, uh, could we please start with Becca Creasy? Good morning. Um, my name is Becca Creasy. I'm VP Division Manager for Lenara Mortgage. I cover the territory for Central Valley, which is Bakersfield to Madeira. Um, probably my biggest concern um, coming in the next five years is the dynamic rate environment that we've been experiencing over the last year alone, along with inventory shortages. Um, I am in a unique perspective of building the inventory that we are actually closing um, with partnering with Lennar the Builder. Um, but hand in hand with growing that workforce, probably the second bigger concern is coming out of a 
COVID and electronically charged environment, also having newer associates that have a higher level of emotional intelligence and communication, um, not relying so much on emails and text messages, but being able to build rapport individually with, um, with clients. So that's probably my number one concern. Welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, Aaron Thomas. Hi, everyone. My name is Aaron Thomas. I'm at Coastline College. I'm the business department chair, and I am the faculty lead of our competency-based education initiative. So that is the perspective that I bring to the discussion. Um, the thing that's keeping me up at night, honestly, is how higher education, especially public higher education, um, is not very well positioned to react with the speed necessary to adjust what we do uh, to meet the needs of, of society in general, but for sure for our workforce. Well, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erin. Uh, Natasha Jankowski, please. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me part of the dialogue. Um, I'm a faculty member and the former executive director of the National Institute for Learning Outcomes Assessment, so I am a lover of all things assessing student learning. And I think my focus at the moment is keeping assessment as meaningful, relevant, and authentic as possible for students, faculty, and institutions as the changing landscape continues to unfold. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natasha. Uh, Victoria Pu, you're next. Hi, thank you for having me and good to see you, everyone. I'm Victoria Pu. I am the founder and CEO of a startup called Pace AI. We are building you were building AI to transform any content into context relevant English language learning lessons for workforce development um, and adult learners. And what's top of mind for me is, is AI and both how that shapes the workforce. Um, and also coming from a research science background, I was in a PhD program working on applied AI ML. So a lot of what's top of mind is how do we translate effectively from theory into practice? And what does that mean for when we hire for AI talent? What do we look for and how does that translate? Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Gary Grace, please. Morning, everybody. Gary Grace, Dean of Innovation at Merced College in the Central Valley of California, halfway between Monterey and uh, Yosemite Valley. And one of our esteemed faculty, Marvin Patton, is on the call today as well. Uh, something that keeps me up at night with all everything that's happening in higher education, similar to what Aaron said, is I really see the value of competency-based education showing that student knowledge is so valuable for, for what it, it does for industry in terms of making career-ready students available to industry partners. And what I mean by that is students have to truly master the competency to be able to move forward through their program versus um, I don't know if anyone else on the call ever received a, a C in a certain class and they were so motivated and excited to just get through with that C and they're never going to use that curriculum again. But if we can truly master so many more skills, I see tremendous value, value for our industry ahead. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, last but not least, uh, Joe Levy, please. Hi, everybody. Joe Levy here. Uh, I... My day job is serving as the Associate Vice Provost of Accreditation and Quality Improvement. It's a long title. Uh, I oversee all things assessment, all things accreditation, and uh, prior learning assessment as well, or credit for prior learning. I work at Excelsior uh, University, which is based in Albany, New York. And then aside from my day job, I also serve on the board of directors for the Student Affairs Assessment Leaders Organization uh, in promoting student affairs assessment work and trying to help um, instill good practices in, in that space. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that I think is going to be really important as we think about the future of higher ed is um, whether it's ROI, uh, good experience, metrics for for what quality looks like is, is making sure that we are thinking about the entire student journey and the, the full scope of success, uh, not just in the classroom, but also outside of the classroom and how we need to do a better job uh, connecting the skills there too, right? Because just we, we all know people who uh, are potentially book smart, but not street smart. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we are preparing all the smarts uh, for, 
for our future graduates and folks um, obtaining credentials and degrees and looking to use those. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. And here we go. Let's uh, uh, let the discussion uh, begin. Uh, Amanda, if you could please uh, uh, take take us to slide one. And uh, it's as, as I mentioned earlier, coaches are going to be uh, taking turns introducing the slides with with uh, with questions. Amanda, please. Enrique, did you have something? Yeah, I want to acknowledge uh, Michelle Dunbar, the other coach. Michelle, oh. would you like? Hi, oh, oh is here? no, yeah, I am here. <laughs> it's oh, okay. Hello. Oh, but Thank but so I know, much. but I, I just yes, I was able to make it, but uh, but I'm not. I don't. You guys have coordinated this, so I'll just I'll just jump in on the discussions if that's okay. If that's, that's <laughs> you don't mind. I'm so sorry. I'm Kat, from Cal State Dominguez Hills. Hi, everybody. So excited to hear this wonderful panel. So thank you all for joining us. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Right. Thank, thank you, you, Enrique. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Without further ado, let's hop in. And I'm so excited to start out with this quote. Sir Ken Robinson is one of the former um, educational leaders that I um, I really adore everything that he says. And I was really sad about his passing a couple of years ago. So here, here's a, a quote to get us started. If you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. We stigmatize mistakes in school. Mistakes are the worst thing you can make. We are educating our kids out of their creative capacities. Just one of the many powerful things that I think Ken Robinson always had to say. If you haven't, if you haven't ever looked him up, I, I highly um, encourage you to, to watch him on YouTube. So let's take a look at our first set of questions for our panelists. Uh, so um, our first topic, bridging the skill gap, industry expectations versus student competencies. First question, combined skills gap and industry perspective. Let's start with a crucial challenge facing the intersection of education and industry. Reflecting on the skills gap, could you share your insights on the key competencies that new graduates often lack according to industry standards? Oh. How could academic programs effectively evolve to bridge this gap? Who would like to go first? Can I just say one thing to, to start it off, uh, just to make sure that as, as we're responding to this question, we are clear about the student population we're talking about. So I, I get the point of new graduates, right? But new graduate can be a you know, 21 year old, fresh out of high school, New graduate can also be a 55 year old who is finally finishing a degree that they started at one point, or it could be say a 30 year old who is just finally going back and getting a degree based on life changes, career changes, or, or even their uh, employer supporting them or, or requiring them to, to have a credential to continue in their role. And I think that's important for us to think about when we have this conversation about skills gap, because that can look different for somebody again, straight out of high school versus somebody who's been working versus somebody who's later in life. Uh, so I just wanted, to, as folks think about their responses, to try and qualify with the populations as well. Great reminder, Joe. Thank you. So which of our panelists would like to follow that? I can go ahead and hop in. Um, I thought a lot about this in regards to uh, especially one of the newer hires that I just brought on. He graduated a year ago and um, some of the other, you know, challenges that I've had in the past. What I see is consciousness as far as situational awareness, um, making sure that they're forecasting tasks and being able to see what is that next thing that I need to be able to do not so much on what is given in front of them, but continually growing within a skill set. Um, so many times I will give an assignment to one of my new associates and they will just stop and wait for the next assignment. Um, in a dynamic commission-based environment, I can't afford to have that happen. Um, I need to have people that are going to continuous continually be self-reliant on that growth and not require me to be pushing them forward. So um, that's a big gap that I see coming in of any age group um, and also hand in hand with um, time management and organizational skills. That seems to be so simple, but uh, probably two of the, the hardest associates I've had to let go were strictly based on time management um, because 
we do have um, customers coming in, phone calls coming in, emails popping up, um, pre-approvals that have to be completed within an hour, um, you know, associates that are internal that need an answer immediately, underwriters calling for structure questions. It, it is extremely dynamic. It can be very, very stressful. And if I don't have an associate that can go through and be able to not, or, not only organize their day, but stick to something that works for them personally and discovering what works for them personally probably is the biggest piece, um, they tend to fail. So I, I try to grow them within, it takes me almost about a year for each of my newer associates to grow into that full position of a loan officer. But within that time, our biggest focus has to be around time management, organizational skills, and then being self-aware of, of what, what that next, next task needs to be. Thank you. Beck, I'll, I'll follow up on that a little bit and uh, relate it to what Joe said as well. Uh, regarding uh, new graduates, uh, I think this isn't just an issue of new graduates. It's also, I think, uh, a side effect from the pandemic in terms of a lot of the, the communication and self-motivation skills that we see, because during the pandemic, we all had to shift really to almost being independent contractors in a way, in that we had to figure out how to manage our time at home while we worked through our days, taking care of families and trying to live life, whatever that meant at the time. Uh, and so how have we have evolved from that? What we've seen, especially what we've noticed at Merced College is with new employees specifically, whether they're a new graduate or have been working in industry for 20 plus years, the pandemic really has had the, the hangover effect of some of these skills gaps. And so the way we've remedied some of this is we've created things like a well-being institute where we teach all new employees certain skills that are needed. So let, let's go over well-being just in general. So what what is good eating habits? What is good time management skills? Uh, and if you're you're all up on your reading and you know all of this information, there's probably still something you can take from this, but really it, it impacts a, a lot of our, our people exponentially in terms of um, filling some of these gaps that can really help them. So I think as employers, we need to think of that as well and how we can support all of our uh, employees, whether they're new graduates or have been working in the field for 20 years, how can we help them be the best employees they can be? Hmm. Aaron, you have your hand up. I'll I'll go after you. Yeah, I think um, in higher ed, especially for a traditional student who moves through um, and goes straight into a four-year bachelor's degree program, um, we aren't providing them with some of the opportunities that we could be providing them to be self-directed because they've spent their entire educational career being told what to do <laughs> and when it's due by. Um, and so we haven't necessarily provided opportunities to learn some of those skills. Um, some ways I think we could do that is, in, and it's also a more authentic assessment is provide options for assessments so that the student has um, a power to make a decision there um, and is responsible for the choice they make um, when they select of an option of, from an option of different assessments. Um, but I think that the biggest challenge is that we, especially when we are talking about traditional systems where there are structured calendars, academic calendars and due dates, we're not, that doesn't create an opportunity for students to learn some of these skills that we know are missing, unfortunately. And across just in this conversation on skills gap pieces, I think there's a couple different ways to to look at it and start to approach it. And, and one can be a lack of awareness on the student's part of what they've learned they know and can do and what knowledge and skills that they have and that those are applicable in different situations and contexts. And some of that's our structure in education. You move through courses, you move through time terms and sort of that gets left behind is like, no, we're, we're integrating, we're building and amassing. And so I think there's a, a space for an awareness gap 
in transparency to students on um, on their, their knowledge, learning, and skills. But I also think there's a communication disconnect between most institutions of higher education and employer communities. And I say that because I've spent a lot of time with institutions that are working with employer advisory boards, and they have these conversations that are you know, we need students or employees that can do X, Y, and Z. And the institution goes, I'm, we have those in our curriculum, they're here. And then the employers are like, I'm not getting that from your graduates. And they're like, well, I taught that in these courses. So I don't, <laughs> and it's this sort of back and forth. So one, I think an openness to understanding that while we might be using different language, that's fine. Getting it down to um, to Aaron's point that the assignment level conversation can be incredibly beneficial. If I'm asking students to do this, does that matter at all in your context? And oftentimes in the employer conversation, it's I want them to do these things in my context on this timeline. And that isn't included in the types of assessment tasks and assignments that we give to our students. And there's some reason for that. There are some times where we don't want to do that with our assignments as higher ed, and we need to be clear to our students. But if there are those places of overlap where it's like, hey, I need you to do this in this way on this timeline, because this has matter and relevancy for the industry that you're going into. And this is something you're going to be asked to do. And you can use this in a job interview to talk about your ability to do this. We need to make that really clear to our students. And the only way we can engage in that is with conversations with our employer partners that are not just sort of the, uh, but I taught that, or I have a course with that title. So we must be doing it. Um, but being open to, to hearing that and helping our students see where they've learned that, when that's happened, why we're asking them to engage and practice different things, uh, because it connects to those knowledge and skills that we want to see elsewhere. I just wanted to add to that, amen, Natasha. And I wanted to make a comment that kind of bridges what I've heard from Natasha and also Becca and offering a perspective coming from the research science side of things where I was previously in a PhD program in applied math. And before that I worked in um, a research lab, it's in industry, but the setting is very different. And that has a different set of scope and requirements for employees than a maybe traditional company like the one we're running today. And a huge thing that I've noticed is that gap in, you know, it, it's not so much that someone we might bring on isn't self-motivated or self-directed in the research setting. They are, they're prolific, you know, prolific publications, great track record, but how do we translate that into the context that the business needs to achieve its aims, to achieve its goals? And that translation is oftentimes missing. And so on the, I really like what Gareth mentioned on the, you know, on the employer side, what are the kinds of supports that we can build in? So one thing that we've done is really time boxing, whether that's a, a project or a task within that project, time boxing it um, and making it very clear, this is the context that needs to be delivered on in this timeline. Um, and then trying to say, okay, you've learned all these great things from higher ed on how to learn and how to think critically. How do you now translate it into that context in a way that's time boxed? Okay, thank you. Oh. Oh, sorry, I was just going to add, um, and I don't want to really derail the, the but just a, another layer to this conversation, I think, is also um, industry taking a hard look at the skills gap they already have. As much as we want to look at the future and uh, new employers, we also need to think about correcting um, like toxic cultures and toxic behaviors that our leaders are role modeling. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure every single one of us at our institutions or in our industries, in our past, and likely in our present, um, you can think of people who you constantly wonder, like, how did they get that job, right? Or, or the old adage of like promoting somebody <laughs> to, to, or moving them into another department rather than firing them. Um, and I think that's, there's truth there. And I think as much I just want to be careful that um, in the spirit of further learning, we are challenging ourselves and not just saying, oh, well, I hope the future students and employer employees are better prepared for this, but also looking in the mirror and saying where we need to learn and upskill and combat negativity and bad practices. Um, because, you know, believe it or not, work doesn't have to be political. And you do not have to be sneaky and read between the lines or build alliances. We can just be productive and do good work um, 
But in order to do that, we have to really examine the cultures we're working in and, and the role models and the people who are upholding those cultures and structures. And it's not just a skills component because, I mean, you can have really skilled technical people, but if they um, don't know how to navigate a toxic culture, you know, I don't think we should focus on trying to teach people how to navigate toxic cultures. I think instead we should be trying to dismantle them. And so I think that's something that we definitely need to include in this conversation. And um, and I think sometimes we we focus a lot on how we can prepare the future to better navigate the current environments, but we can also be rectifying the current environments as well. Thanks, Joe. It's like you pardon me up for our perfect segue into both question two and question three, and I'm keeping an eye on the time. And and we kind of figured this would be issue since you all have such brilliant things to say, we're not gonna get to all the questions. So I'm gonna read both of these questions because I feel they intertwine very well and each of your expertise can address them in the form that's best for you. So hold it all in mind there in the screen as well. But I love your point, Joe, on this emotional intelligence piece. And the question focuses more on how higher education's role, but I would love for our industry also to say what they're doing to address those concerns that you articulated as well. So hold tight. I'm going to read both these questions and then our um, panel can address the parts of it that, that they would like to. So the first question will be moving to a topic that's increasingly at the forefront of education, personal development. How can higher education curricula be restructured to incorporate vital skills like emotional intelligence and conflict resolution? And in your view, how do these personal attributes enhance technical proficiencies to better meet the involving demands of industry? And the second part of it might be, let's look ahead in the future. In your opinion, what are the most critical changes that higher education institutions should make to their academic content and soft skill training. Specifically, how can these adaptations align with the dynamic and ever-changing requirements of today's job market? And I know that's like a 50-fold question. So whichever part our panel would like to address, go ahead. I'm happy to jump in and sort of take a, a, a piece of this and keep building off of what Joe was saying in, in some of this regard. One of the things, so I had the pleasure to work on a couple of uh, foundation projects that funded employer partnerships with um, community-based organizations, education and training providers, basically, employers and education and training providers to get students moving through. And part of that conversation was not, was to shift from the what do you need, how do we make sure that they get it, but to move to more relational accountability to say, where do we have shared responsibility for these outcomes? What makes sense for certain areas um, for employers to come in and teach uh, or for students to learn in different environments and really rethink and reshape what those partnerships look like from a sort of talent pipeline model of what is the flow and where do we start to bleed into each other in, in these areas and spaces. And I think it, one of our ways to move forward to address this is to take a hard look at how have we structured our partnerships and our relationships? What do we think each of our different expectations and roles are in there? And do those make sense for us to really create a meaningful future space for, for our students or are we perpetuating things that we, we don't want to? And are there ways that we can ask for different relationships, different commitments and different um, engagement with our employer partners who are looking to also have something different coming out of that of that work. So that's one sort of piece I wanna put out there is to think about like, take a look, don't just assume or be like, we have a board, we have a group, but do you wanna engage differently and what do you wanna make of that ask to get to that, to that shared accountability? And the second thing I wanna caution us in as we kind of move forward in some of these spaces is a tendency that we've had in kind of employer surveys from higher ed that say, you know, they can, employers are fine with teaching technical skills because those will change over time or different things will get advanced and they can handle that. So we will just cover for you these more like durable or um, uh, other skills that are more transferable and adaptable. And the, the point that's really hard in here um, that I think is also coming up in this conversation is the transference of those skills to different settings and contexts is something that has to be practiced consistently, routinely over time, many different contexts and environments and one in which um, internally to our own talent pipeline development as employers, we need to be thinking about with our employees. And so saying, I'll handle this, you do the <laughs> these other parts, may be a disservice to some of our situations and going, how can we think about that in our partnership and responsibility, but also where we're reinforcing and engaging in our learning on this um, 
to, to really not perpetuate future challenges that we're experiencing today, if any of that makes sense. So I was thinking about this too, in regards to the emotional intelligence of, of how we interact um, with outside um, borrowers that are coming in and and how this like relates to preparing um, students for higher education, because this was kind of a difficult thing to to think like, like how, how would you change that like from a higher education perspective? And the, the thing that I see is students or you know new hires that are coming in they have one set way of doing things and until they sit down in front of a borrower and present their scenarios or their sales pitch and if they don't have the emotional intelligence to be able to sit down and absorb that that's not working that they need to shift and change the way that they're doing their job and problem solve in front of this person um, requires a ton of emotional intelligence and um, an ability that takes a lot of time to master. So it's, and it's, it's always something that regardless of age, industry experience, educational experience um, to build because it is so difficult and um, time consuming. Uh, it, the only way I could see of, of overcoming it would be consistent practice. So if, if that's in regards to, you know, creating an environment that's interactive with some sort of presentation where it adjusts as they're presenting it, I don't know what that exactly looks like, but I do see that that, that is an issue that comes in because that's very, very difficult to build off of. That makes sense. Um, I'd like to jump in and um, ex uh, explain that some of the really innovative thinking that's coming out of our work on competency-based education is an adjustment in assessments and to um, kind of dovetailing with the emergence of newer technologies that could allow exactly what Becca was talking about. Um, there's a company called Mersion, M-U-R-S-I-O-N out there that through scripted, pre-scripted scenarios with options and um, you know, if then else kind of cases, um, you can interact in um, with avatars, um, be presented with a scenario and be um, re required to respond to different things that happen in that scenario. Um, and so we're looking at this as a method of testing, an assessment, I should say, of students in handling things like conflict resolution or um, coaching, because uh, our degree is in management and both of those skills are necessary for our graduates. So it's an interesting time because the technology, we have got some newer technologies that we could be considering. So far and away from, you know, you're not going to be able to assess these kinds of skills with final exams and multiple choice tests, right? So let's be creative in our thinking about how we are assessing some of these durable skills. I appreciate you interpreting that for me because I was trying to put it in in a way that made sense of, of how could it be taught other than practicing it. Um, so I apologize if it was kind of a roundabout way, but that, that was my goal. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for uh, we have uh, time is clicking away. So thank you so much. Uh, if you don't mind, can we move to our next uh, with your permission? Uh, Amanda, can you move to the next slide? Uh, so thank you so much. Um, I'm going to quote uh, Cheryl Sandberg. Um, Careers are not a ladder. They are a jun uh, jungle gym. Look for the opportunities. Look for growth. Look for impact. Look for mission. Move sideways. Move down. Move on. Move off. This is my favorite. Build your skills, not your resume. Evaluate what you can do, not the title you're going to give to you. Um, so with that being said, let's move to the next slide, Amanda. Thank you. Um, um, Enrique, sorry, but Amanda is on the call. She has an emergency. Who's, who's moving the slides, Jerick? You're moving the slides? 
Okay. Can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so we're uh, we have a second uh, question, and it's preparing students for nonlinear career path uh, paths. And um, panelists, please do shine in. We are have three questions. Um, I am not going to read all the questions, but I'm uh, is giving you a insight of what's happening with the uh, transferable skills in development, the managing career transitions, and the uh, that adaptability in career paths. Um, keep in mind, this is nonlinear career paths. And I know we have Becca, where you're in the uh, private sector, right? And uh, Erin, you mentioned something really wonderful about skills and competencies. And it's a good transition to what the panelists were talking about. So anyone, would you like to take uh, question number one and talk about that? How do you embrace the educational uh, transfer skills? As someone who's an entrepreneur right now, I can I can start with Thank that. Thank you, Victoria. One. I was going to pick on you since you were the one. I was going to pick on you. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. So I think for and I think this actually really dovetails nicely from something that Natasha brought up in the on the previous conversation around this idea of. What skills are these intangible but yet durable skills that are coming out? Um, I think a lot of this is, um, you know, especially for us working in the field of AI, uh, everything in artificial intelligence is inherently so new and fast changing every day is different. And so in some ways, as an employer, I kind of see that hard and soft skills divide as kind of artificial because in many ways, it's really about you know, building those hard skills in ways that are context relevant. And that in its in and of itself, that critical thinking around how to reformulate or repurpose my hard technical skills into something, into a particular context, that in of itself is kind of a soft skill. And so a, in a lot of ways, it's can we create environments as employers, as educators to foster building that um, and building, you know, the lifelong learning around cultivating this critical thinking and these first principles thinking around transitioning something that is a technical skill into you know, context relevance. Um, and so I think that's something I, I think a lot about kind of from the employer side, especially from a technical and kind of AI focused angle. Thank you, Victoria. We all, we all also often use lifelong learners, right? Have you heard this before? And so I think that's a good segue uh, in comparing to nonlinear career paths. Uh, anyone else? I'll hop in on that. Uh, so uh, I'm, similar to what Victoria said, we have to allow for this transferability of both soft skills and, and hard skills and embrace that entrepreneurial spirit in everything we do. So how do we in higher education really promote lifelong learning and give students some experience in what that looks like? Because the reality is, we don't know what the job market looks like in 10 years, 20 years. Uh, if Victoria would have said probably 15 years ago, uh, I really want to work on uh, developing an AI company. Uh, that thought probably didn't uh, cross uh, the mind at that time. And so we have to think about how can this evolve and continue to evolve? Uh, and we need to figure out ways to do that. I, I think some strategies to do that really are on how we design curriculum in higher education. So how do we embrace some of these mindsets and really a growth mindset within education? That is where I, I really see the benefit of competency-based education because students aren't sitting there for seat time, they're sitting there for checking off competencies and mastering competencies, and they can progress at their own pace. So we have some students that will be done um, in two weeks with their master's degrees. We have some students that will take 12 years to complete that master's degree. And that is okay, because maybe the one that takes 12 years is also working a, a job supporting their family, and they're doing it more for 10 years from now, I want to do a career change to X or to Y or to Z. I'm not sure yet. Where the other student says, in three weeks, I want to be hired at company A. In order to do that, I need this degree 
So I think really we need to think forward on uh, how we can continue to upskill um, and move students through these systems and really embrace that mindset for um, continuing to to move to the future. And because we don't know what uh, five years, 10 years, 20 years looks like. One thing that I think can be valuable to, to this question too is, um, I say it all the time, curriculum mapping and outcome mapping serves a lot of beneficial byproducts and purposes. Unfortunately, uh, it, it it can be viewed as a necessary evil or I, I know in my instance, working across multiple institutions, it often, they unfortunately, they're often started or created because I ask for them by way of assessment because I'm wanting to try and understand how the program fits together. And they're like, oh, well, here's all these syllabi. And I was like, no, syllabi, <laughs> I, I need to see it together and that there's harmony in the alignment of these things and see the weight behind how often some of these learning outcomes are being introduced, reinforced, and demonstrated. Uh, but there's also value in that, seeing how that content, both inside and outside the classroom, can transfer, right? If we have institutional learning outcome frameworks, where we're seeing where course learning outcome rolls up to program learning outcomes, rolls up to a university level, we can also see that those alignments between a uh, student affairs or co-curricular intervention department division in institution level. And when we have that articulated, we can zoom out and follow those connections and use that as a common language to traverse the ever uh, real gap between academic affairs and student affairs to have common ground to talk about student success with common nomenclature of the learning outcomes, but also to be able to translate that to students so that when a student comes into the class, we're not just sitting there talking about, this is the class, these are your assignments, this is when things are due, but we can really pause and say, this is what this class is about. These are the things we're going to cover. This is why this is important to your program. Right? You're building off of these skills you learned from this previous course. We're introducing some skills you're going to cover in a future course. And this is how this relates to your industry. And these learning outcomes are relevant to these degrees. Likewise, outside of the classroom, when a student goes to a workshop or um, steps into the career services office, they can also be hearing from staff. This is what we're hoping you get out of this intervention. These are the things, the skills we're hoping to surface we're hoping to refine we're hoping to have you be able to articulate and we're hoping so you can see the connection between you know the the volunteering that you're doing and the student ac activity that you're involved in and how those leadership skills and that compassion carries over to the classroom and into your industry and we can draw those connections through learning outcomes but also more importantly help students make those connections so that they can talk about it and so that they can take a step back and think about where I would like to grow, how can I do that? And not just what courses can I take, but what can I get involved in outside of the classroom that'll help develop those skills as well and put me on the path to success. Thank you, Joe. You mentioned a good point about curriculum and also the core the core, course line of record. And I know we have uh, cross-listed courses whose skills transferable to you know from one discipline to another discipline. So that's a good point, thank you. Any, any uh, panelists yeah, would like to address that? If I can jump into this too, I think this also speaks to sort of, and this is something I harp on all the time, that clarity that we need to make this stuff clear. We spend all this time on design and then we tell no one about it. And we're just like, didn't you know? We're so thoughtful. We're great educators and we don't pass that forward. But that's actually been some of the value to students for micro-credentials has been less on the employer side of things and more on a student being like, I actually better understand and can communicate about what I know and can do. And these courses hung together more <laughs> coherently than some of these other spaces. And if that's helpful to the learner to be able to make that case and has value, then there's value in there in, in meaningful ways um, for, for, for this part. So transparency and making it clear, I think are huge. And when we also think about like, what are ways that we can teach some of these things to our students? We give so much to them, to Joe's point at the syllabus, we're like, here's all this stuff that we figured out for you. And we forget that this probably is not their priority. 
in their lives at the moment. Like education is there and it's nice and I'm happy to participate, but this is not likely, and I'm so sorry, education people, if this is like breaking your heart, the most important thing that they're going through or they're engaged in. And this is a great opportunity to be like, what do you need to set yourself up for success? What is your project management plan to get through this course? Like if these assignments don't work because of life events that are happening for you in assignment timing, Let's map out your term, figure out what's going on, what works with your work schedule, what's not. Propose to me an alternative solution, and then let's see how you stayed on that track. And did that work? Did it not? You know, these are important skills that you need in a variety of contexts. So can you figure out how to take something and make this work and be successful? So there are those ways that we focus on, can we teach you how to learn, but we don't teach you how to manage your learning. And really think about what do you need to get that done to complete tasks and what do you need to be successful? Like, we're like, what's your writing process? But if you're a last minute writer, like you're just like, I procrastinate until the day of, and that's when I do my best writing. How do you need to trick yourself to put things into your calendar for like due dates or change it? Like, what do you need to do to make these things work so you can get things done? And that piece of you are the one that's being educated. This can be a learning experience for you as you're doing the things that we want you to engage in. I don't think we capitalize enough. Um, and then we have these sort of complaints that we could address in our structure of how we set it up. So be as clear as possible. Definitely. But also think about how we can take some of these things that we're already doing and turn them into opportunities for students to really practice, reflect, and hone some of these skills um, that they have elsewhere. And don't negate the importance of micro-credentials if employers don't value them as much because the importance to students to talk about what they know and can do, to see value in education from it, to find coherence across their courses is value enough in and of itself. Um, but yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, there we go. Um, I loved hearing um, Natasha talk about knowing and doing, um, but I, I want to um, be a little bit of a contrarian because what we do is we measure learning. We don't necessarily measure doing. And so I think that has to be a mind shift change for us in higher education to, to go from the knows through the shows and get to the, the do you are capable of doing it. Um, again, with competency-based education, that has to be demonstrated. And so it's forcing us to really consider how we assess learners because we're not, we learning isn't necessarily what we're wanting to assess. We want to assess the ability to do something. Uh, so I, I think it's a challenge for all of us in higher ed. We, have, we make an assumption that if you've learned something, you can do something. And I don't think that's a safe assumption for us to be making. Thank you. So with that being said, it's a good transition. Uh, I oh, with the, how do we, then how do we, uh, as uh, higher educators manage, you know, the students' career to transition to different careers? Um, how do we manage that? Uh, this war is, you know, is, is changing rapidly. Uh, the industry is changing rapidly, right? And so we talked about the skills and competencies from, you know, from um, slide number one. We are now talking about preparing students for nonlinear career paths. So then how do we answer the second question? Uh, Becca? So the program that um, I've had the most success with, with our loan officer associates gives the ability, and, and it's really geared towards um, students that are just graduating from college to go through a year program of training to be able to become a loan officer. Where I have seen a lot of success as for, and this is where I'm mapping in with the, the career transitions is actually uh, second career associates. So people that have gotten their degree have gone into an industry and maybe they've hit their ceiling or maybe they've hit, um, or maybe maybe they got into that that career because they had a family young and they they had to do something and and now they're realizing okay the kids are in school I have this time now I can I can focus on me and I've had so much success with these transitions um, because these people not only want to succeed but understand um, how hard it is in this environment and and try that much harder but to go back to those micro degrees that you guys were discussing those people that have gone out and come to me with um, their licensing already completed or those courses, um, those pre-courses for those licensing um, and be able to can show those credentials to me stand out considerably 
um, amongst, you know, the sea of, of resumes and applications that I get of students that are coming in. So to me, those show that extra step above and beyond what everybody else that you not only are just trying to look for a job, but you're looking for a career. And just as much that I'm investing in you to grow that career, you're doing that ahead of time to show me that you're ready to jump into this. Um, because I was, you know, I don't look for short-term employees. I look for a team that I'm building together and this is their end goal. So I, I totally agree with that path. And I think that that's amazing um, and, and absolutely sets you apart from, from the crowd. Becca, can I jump and ask quick, a quick question and follow up? Um, is that mostly like on paper when you're reviewing them or also in the interview, are you finding that they're able to articulate better some of those skills and things? Because uh, to, to Natasha's point about them really understanding more because of having gone through a micro-credential, for example. You know, it's going to be both because I have had instances where they've gone through the course to check the box. And in our conversations, it's quite obvious that they didn't absorb it um, because I'm, I'm asking questions to get to the bottom of, of one, how how quick of a learner are they? And, and are they going to be able to take this fast paced environment? Mm -hmm. um, and then two, the ones that really have invested that time in and structure their answers and their questions along with that knowledge to not only um, a builder environment, but um, to the job specifically that they've researched. That to me is, is showing that competency and that desire to be there. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, Victoria? Thank you. I actually wanted to chime in also from an employer standpoint on micro-credentialing. I think to Becca's point too, it definitely stands out to me, but perhaps ironically for a different reason. For me, it definitely shows the soft skill aspect of the determination, the drive, mm -hmm. the I want to be here, that kind of desire. And that certainly can, you know, all else equal be something that moves the needle in giving that first interview. But for us, it in no way replaces them. I'm really talking about more the context of hiring for software engineering, engineering, AI kinds of professionals, um, IT included. And in that context, it will never replace um, the problem solving. And that's what that first round interview is meant to do, is to assess for first principles thinking, problem solving in that context, the really doing parts of, so you've learned it, but now can you do it? Um, but I do think, you know, it perhaps ironically is a great signal for that soft skill aspect of, are you self-driven and motivated? I totally agree. Thank you. If I could just add one thing that I'm hearing through this and, and get the panelists' reactions to it is a different way that students move through and engage with education. So one of this is we have this structure that's very education-centric. That's like, you come here, you're here for X amount of time, then you leave, you have this degree, and then it's like, bye, you're alumni, now you give us money, right? Like that's sort of our relationship with them. Or like, maybe you go on for another degree, but it's these big chunks of time and we do it. And I think it's becoming more fluid um, in a way that's also based on attention and interest that we have of student populations that are coming in. And to Joe's point, this is really dependent on what you're counting as different student populations. Um, but where there is this sort of like, look, I want to come in, I want to do these two things, and then I want to step out. And I want to have these kinds of experiences and I want to do this kind of work and I want to have this kind of profession. And then I want to step back in. And while I'm doing something else, I don't want this to have to be an either or. Um, and I want to engage differently in how I'm going about doing my education. And I'm not sure if as institutions of higher education, we're really welcoming to an ongoing relationship with our students in that way that we're like, you aren't completing fast enough. Like you're taking too long doing life and working and getting all this valuable experience and getting different credentials and degrees. And some of that's our, you know, structure of metrics. And, but some of that's also just like how our programs and things are designed. And part of what could be a benefit to us in design on micro-credentials is a shift to say, do we have paths that are meaningful available to students that want an ongoing relationship with us to come in, to come out, to come back in five years when the industry changed, to reskill, to upskill, because they had a positive experience when they were here, that they felt that it was valuable and they learned a lot and not like, well, I can learn this on YouTube or I can go into LinkedIn <laughs> learning and I can watch some videos and I can get this, or I can just sit for the licensure exam and I can just get that and jump into a career. And I think the more that we can try, make our case about how we can be relevant at different points in times and that that is an equally valid and important path and relationship to us, um, the 
the better we might be for for being responsive and timely and useful in these different ways. But just a thought. Natasha, that's a wonderful segue for question number three. We're talking about paths, you know, so uh, traditional careers are becoming, you know, a thing in the past. How do you how do we deal with that? Uh, do we use I know we have some of us we have guided pathways, right? Uh, some of the colleges. How do we deal with this question? The last question. I'll just kick it off. I think some of these are so hidden that they're not really pathways. Like if I have to mm -hmm. knock on a secret door on a Tuesday, writing a zebra to get access to it, like it's not a real option to me. And there are things like that. For years, prior learning assessment has been that way for students. We're like, if you get the right advisor that knew about it at the right time, you know, you can jump ahead and it should not be these, um, if these are of equal value, if we do think this is important, if it is actually about getting to the doing of the learning, then there are many ways that we can get there. And there are many ways that our students need and want to get there. Uh, and so some of it can be, are we making these actually meaningfully accessible or do we just have it on paper? Um, and then we're like, oh, no one uses it. We'll get rid of that and funnel them into these other programs, I think is a question we should ask ourselves. I'll follow up to what Natasha said in terms of, um, I, my, I'll, I'm not going to be great with this example, but as you said, with the, the Tuesday knocking on the door, riding the zebra, I think that I'm quoting that correctly. Um, with that process and thinking about prior learning for our students and being adaptable to that, what we're looking at with these pilot institutions in competency-based education in the state of California is really a, a big part of that is credit for prior learning. And so not saying, okay, you've been in the industry for 15 years uh, doing whatever the job may be, but I'm going to just call it entry level job A. And in order to get intermediate job B, you need this certificate, whatever that certificate might be, or maybe it's the associates that you need, you need something. And so really honoring that 15 years of entry level work at, at um, job A. And so when that student comes for that CBE program, we say, okay, let's look at how many of these competencies you've already mastered. Oh, wow. So we have say 85 competencies in this program. You've already mastered 46 of these. Here's your credit for prior learning for these. Now you're going to focus on the other competencies that you need to succeed. And so then we can get them through the program much quicker because they've already mastered so much of this First, our traditional model was really, um, you're right, it, unless you have the right advisor to give you credit for prior learning, many students don't know about that option or, or whether that even exists. It's kind of uh, the the unspoken of program where, uh, and I was a, a benefactor of uh, credit for prior learning. In high school, I did two years of Spanish. And so when I got to college, my advisor, wonderful uh, advisor said, you have uh, a background in Spanish. I see that on your transcript from high school. Why don't you do credit for prior learning? I don't even know what those words mean. Okay, you're going to, I'm going to coordinate a test for you. You're going to do this test. You're going to test out. The next day I had 10 units on my transcript of Spanish. Um, so those are the kind of experiences that can move students through programs quicker. And so then we aren't taking chunks of our life out to take four years off to go get that other degree really to upskill to intermediate position B or even to expert position C, I need just this little extra part. And so let's in higher ed not create a barrier and instead motivate and move students through that as quickly as possible, but also still maintaining the integrity of the, the degree that they're seeking. And I think that's really kind of the, the niche market that we have to figure out how do we do that because it, it is untraditional in terms of higher education over uh, the past decades. Well, in higher ed, it's kind of like the 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 conversation a bit before, right? Of like, do we prep people to learn how to navigate a toxic or broken system versus fix the system? And I think that applies here too, right? We we spend a lot of time and energy thinking about, oh, what are the resources and what are the things we can do for students in order to best navigate the complicated structure we have set up? Instead of saying, how can we uncomplicate this structure? and actually orient it around students who don't know what higher ed is, who don't know what our terms are, who don't know the opportunities in front of us. Why isn't this, why isn't every institution just doing a, an intake model of personally talking to students? Or, and, and there's actually a lot of companies and systems out there of 
intake surveys of what are you looking to learn? What's your preferred learning format? What's your modality? What experience do you have? So that then at the end of completing that, even just an online form, they can do it two in the morning. They get a personalized readout of you should be aware that you may qualify for credit already. Check out these links for credit for prior learning. And based on your interest and based on your format, uh, format preference for education, I know you said you're interested in this program. We don't offer it in that modality. So would you be open to like in person or hybrid versus online? Or would you want to consider these other similar degree programs based on your interests and work experience? Everybody could be doing that right now. Instead, we're doing, here's our catalog, here's our website, or, you know, talk to us, but I, I got 50 million phone calls. So unless you got your act together, like I'll come back to you. You know, we could totally, instead of getting students to conform to us, in the structures we have made that often we don't even understand amongst ourselves within the institution, let alone talking across institutions, why aren't we focusing on revamping it to better meet the student need? That's how we'll get the success. That's how they will better navigate the environment because they won't have to navigate anything. We will be helping them through the journey and walking alongside them instead of saying, instead of handing them materials and saying, good luck. Yo, is that is that how we prepare students for the job market? I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think, you know, it, it's not a matter of obviously like removing all barriers, removing all hurdles, and um, spoon feeding students a degree, but we can also be catering this learning environment, which is what it's supposed to be—a learning environment to be conducive to learning and not have unnecessary barriers and unnecessary complications and language that they don't understand. Because then it can be a training ground and then they can knowingly enter into challenging situations and job prep situations and job prep environments um, rather than having to navigate those stressors on top of navigating higher ed to earn this credential that they need to get to that environment in the first place. Great. Uh, we have a question from uh, Joe Lowe's, uh, one of the participants. J uh, Jeff, would you like to uh, uh, unmute yourself and speak to what you mentioned on the uh, chat? I guess not. All right. Uh, any further before we move on? Um, I just wanted to um, respond to one of the notes I see about um, K-12 sort of approaches being replicated in higher ed. And I and I do think that's a challenge. And one of our problems for folks who, for those students who have the privilege of going straight out of high school and into college is in the state of California, is at least, we've indoctrinated students to believe that they have to go to college and that they have to get a four-year degree. Um, I My children are in, in that age where they're leaving the higher ed system or the um, K through 12 system in California and moving into higher ed, and they they had no concept that they could do anything other than just go to college. So I think that also does a disservice to us as a society when we have many um, um, other skills that are needed, um, all the, all sorts of like construction and all those other kinds of programs. So I think at least in California, we've got to change the narrative of what we're telling learners as they move through the K through 12 system, they need to be thinking about getting whatever credential they need to get their first job <laughs> and to be told that that first job may not exist today and it will be a first job and you will have a bunch of different jobs, but that's not what they're hearing, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jarek, would you like to move on to three? Yep, it's Benny's turn. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Trip, can you move to the next slide? All right, so let's begin with a quote from uh, Ariana Huffington. Uh, Be clear and concise, stating the specific of how your mental health problems are impacting your work. The point here is to keep it professional and appropriate. Your boss is not a therapist or close friends. So you need to stick to what matters to the workplace. Uh, next slide, please.
So now that brings you to the uh the third topics, which will be uh mental health awareness and support in workplace. Uh, we have three questions, uh, so, uh, around promoting mental health literacy, implementing mental health strategy questions, combating workplace uh, bullying. So anyone would like to uh, take a look and start? I can jump in. To get okay, thank you, Natasha. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, you can always find something to say. Um, I think two points to think about in this space is there's a need for this for our faculty and our staff, as well as our students. And oftentimes a conversation is focused on sort of how are we preparing students to this piece, but our faculty and our staff need to be a, a large part of our focus on mental health support and awareness, particularly in the workplace of higher education. Um, we have a lot of survey data on students that looks a lot like the survey data on faculty and staff in terms of where they're where they are in their um, dealing with these things. So we can model for our students what this should look like in a workplace that they go into by doing that for our employees. And I think that's a, a nice opportunity for us to engage in. Um, the second thing that I would say is integrate with community-based supports. Um, sometimes we think as institutions, we have to build this and structure it entirely on our own. But depending on your context and situation, um, connecting with community-based opportunities, structure, supports, environments, Whatever um, that might be is a uh, a good use of your time. All right, panelists, I've bought you time. Good, go for it. All right, thank you, Natasha. Uh, Karen? Thank you, Natasha. Uh, I'll go back to what Joe opened with, actually, in terms of um, kind of modeling good behaviors from leaders on campuses. I believe it was Joe that opened with that. If I'm, it wasn't, I'm sorry. Um, but really talking about modeling those behaviors on your campus. And so, for our students, they need to see that. In order for students to see that, we need to have uh, employees on campus have those skills and be ready with those skills. Uh, so I think it's equally as important to educate our employees across the board, faculty, staff, administration, to, to have those skills. So then when uh, they're trying to implement some of these practices into their classroom settings, they know how this is going to play out. They know the why, the reasons for really, what does this do for my my students? So does it help to do a five minute brain break halfway through the class? Does it help to, okay, class, we're just, I, I, I see that nobody is understanding what I'm saying right now. Let's just take two minutes, stand up, move around a little bit, say hi to your neighbor, and then let's come back at this. So the willingness to, um, for, all of our campus to understand really mental health awareness so then we can help our students. Uh, I don't think it's something that we just uh, prescribe and say, all right, uh, faculty number one, you need to do these in your classroom or counselor number one, you need to tell your uh, advisees these are the most important things for he mental health awareness. I think it is across the board. It, it is all of us that needs to be involved in this work because that's, I think, the best way to really support our students. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, Becker? Yeah, so thinking about this and your first slide, as far as that um, employer not being your therapist or somebody that you cry to, um, I see that, but I disagree. Um, most of the time when I've had uh, employees backslide and th do things that are unexpected or things that, that just make no sense. It's usually a very serious conversation of sitting down and finding out what is personally going on with them and having those interpersonal skills to be able to have them explain to me what is happening in their life. Because these, is, these are people that I am financially and emotionally invested with. So having that um, understanding of, of those conversations you need to have with your employer, your boss, um, and having that um, relationship and that comfort level, obviously, there's to a degree, of course, and understanding what is serious versus not, um, I, I think is important because otherwise it just leads that employer to believe that either you don't care or you've given up or you've moved on or 
they don't understand the circumstances that's going on in your life. So I think that that can be something that could be very, very healthy um, and also very helpful because we are human. We do have lives. We do lose, you know, relatives and, and things happen. So um, not, you know, still understanding that human side of, of all aspects, I think is important. The other piece that I was pulling from this is making sure that you're having that work-life balance, um, especially coming from a commission-based environment. That's something that a lot of my loan officers struggle with because, you know, when people buy houses is usually when they're off and when they're off, we want to be off and that's not the case. So creating healthy boundaries of, Hey, these are my hours. These are when I'm working. Um, this is, this is when I, I can get to this, or this is when I have this appointment, um, is, is a necessity to survive in this industry because you're going to get burnt out. And I get a lot of people that are burnt out. Um, and, and especially if they're coming in fresh out of college, they want to prove themselves. They want to get it going. And you don't understand that even at that younger age, you can burn yourself out. So I, I see both of those things with the slide that, yeah, it, it is important to share and to have those connections, um, but also to create boundaries. Thank you, Becca. Uh, Enrique? Well, for the panelists, for me, is, is do we teach those um, skills or is it part of our our goal, our college goals to teach the students with, uh, to adapt to the skills? That's a good question right there. Are you asking me? Yes. I don't know if it's something to teach those skills. I guess it would be to accept and have the conversations around it, um, to be able to show instances where things have come up and having that open communication where there is still understanding the repercussions behind um, if, if something's not able to get done or if, if something needs to be rescheduled or, or completed in a different way of, of being able to dynamically change with a situation with a student specifically to, to show that understanding, um, you know, within a reason, obviously, because you couldn't do that on a mass scale. But um, I, I think with that, yeah. Um, and then as far as the, the boundaries, um, I, I think that's more of a life skill, but I was just kind of commenting on, on things that I see is, is difficult, uh, with, with people coming into that career. Thank you. Uh, uh Victoria. I think, um, something that's kind of the, the flip side of that same coin of what Becca is talking about is to Joe's earlier point of as employers also when we take a look in the mirror and think about the ways that we can make that make that easy for someone to, you know, approach their boss and be that transparent and honest and open is as employers, do we cultivate a workplace that has psychological safety where people are not going to have repercussions for coming to us? Um, of course, you know, with, with appropriate boundaries, but um, having that environment where, you know, it is okay to have and express differences in opinions on tasks or uh, projects. Um, and then also with, you know, with allowing and respecting that people have lives outside of work and that work-life balance, work-life integration aspect. Um, but it really needs to come from, from the employer's side, having that psychological safety and like open door type of policies and things like that. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, Natasha? Yeah, I was going to say, there's some of the things, so part of this question is like, what can we do as faculty? And I think one of the things that we can do as faculty is share. Like, we don't talk about this in class and we don't share how we're doing or where we are and that act of vulnerability, then we can't expect that of our students or create that kind of culture and environment in our classroom to engage in that. So one of this can be, we can share things as faculty, like, oh, you know, we need, we need to change this summer rough week. And here's where I'm at these things. Cause there's all, if you look at higher ed, it is not a great work-life balance. Like we are not a good example, particularly at institutions that are driven by like uh, some faculty positions are, are very stressed out and you should be like, don't be like me. <laughs> and let me explain why and engage in that. Like I am not the mentor you seek in this work-life balance, but we can engage in things too. Like think about our, our teamwork tasks that we give to students. So the amount of times that a faculty member is like, do this as a group. 
but we don't do something like set group norms and boundaries that you expect to be respected through this. Um, what are the ways that you want to work and communicate with each other? At what times? Um, when is it not okay to engage with me? And what does that look like? And like set those and how do we keep them? And then let's reflect on like, did I get the right boundaries? Did I respect other people's boundaries? How did I not? We can build that into some of these spaces where students are going, I don't understand still how to work well in teams because I just worked with a group of people. I didn't actually engage in what it means to do teamwork. Um, I didn't figure out roles. I didn't figure out values and norms and engage in that boundaries. And so these are things that we can put into our existing work and assignments to help students start to think about, to engage in that, that that should be an expectation when you are in these areas and spaces, that you're having these conversations, that you're setting these things up, um, that you're saying, what do we do if someone needs some time? Um, if things come up unexpectedly, how do we plan for that? And who's a backup on a, a part of this? So that we're prepared when that happens. And these are things that we can ask and structure into those tasks and assignments that make them more relevant, that start to flex those muscles that students will then need to, to engage in engaging in a work-life balance in, a, in an employer space. So that is something I think that we can't do as faculty. Natasha, I think that's perfect. The vulnerability side of it, that, that sums it up. Exactly. Thank you. And I would just add good role modeling. You know, one of the things, I, um, not to toot the horn of my institution but our provost is really good at like he doesn't answer emails after 5 p.m and like he if, if you're emailing or, or texting him he will say stop <laughs> and you know when he doesn't feel well he will leave for the day this you know this morning he, he left the meeting he said i'm not feeling well right i mean he is demonstrating good healthy behaviors right and so when you have that happening with your institutional leaders, then you feel more likely to follow up with that instead of being like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be out, but you can reach me on my phone, right? Um, so again, setting those boundaries, but making sure that, you know, that's that's role modeled by, by your institutional leaders as well. Thank you. I guess one, one of the questions that I have maybe like, how do we help faculty to build a larger capacity? Because we see so many students and then they, I think now our students are more willing to share uh, what they're experiencing. And then from time to time, as you, as you build up throughout the semester, then it becomes quite a bit for the faculty to handle. Uh, what, what can the faculty do? I think that, that could be another topic for the panelists to talk about become best friends with student affairs. So I would say this is a great opportunity for student affairs to do professional development for faculty on like, this is their every day <laughs> on student affairs side where students just come in and are like, guess what you thought you were doing at work today? Not that because blah, now you must deal with this that I'm bringing to you, you know, in that situation. And that there's huge amounts of resources within our student affairs um, on uh, tools, and ways to navigate, how to engage with that. So some of it is, do you know where to send students um, if you are not comfortable in engaging with that? And do you know the person or the right connection so that you can immediately get students to the things that they need instead of a sort of general space? Um, but also, how can we partner differently with our student affairs if you're like, this is not something that I can handle. And here's going to be a busy time. Like this is going to come. What do you have going on student affairs? Here's what I'm having happening. Do we have the right resources and things in place to support our students and our staff at this time um, for these things? And if that requires us to have that conversation across um, sometimes some very siloed organizational spaces. But yes, if you don't have a student affairs friend, um, that is your task for next week. Find one and, um, and, and engage in friendship. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. Erin? Uh, um, to follow on, to answer your question, Benny, and, and to follow on what Natasha said, I think um, faculty are being asked to take on more and more and, and be um, more things to our students. And I'd like to suggest that we as faculty need to consider having a really different relationship with um, student affairs and student success coaches and student support personnel um, in non uh public institutions that are doing competency-based education, the roles are real different. And I think it's something that we could learn from where by those 
roles, faculty, student success coaches, they're partners. They're both in the classroom. <laughs> and um, each brings expertise to those roles, be it faculty discipline expertise, but student affairs expertise with coaching, counseling, et cetera. Um, if we can let go as faculty and share more of the burden with our academic success coaches and our other student affairs peers, I think it will also reduce our workload. But it takes giving up a little bit of uh, control that faculty, especially in the state of California, have, have felt around their classrooms. But I think it's, it's a worthwhile trade-off for us to be considering. All right, thank you, panelists. Uh, due to the time that we have, uh, let's try to move to the next topic. Uh, Jerk, can you move to the next slide? And we'll have uh, Danny take over. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Benny. So let's start with a quote from Angela Davis. Everyone has the potential to become an agent of change. So within that context, let's, uh, let's now look at the uh, next slide. So I think with this slide, with these questions, we're looking to apply an equity and inclusivity lens over the conversation that we've been having. I think many of these questions are related also to self-direction, something we talked about earlier in the conversation. So I'm prepared at any moment to open it to any of the panelists, if anyone wants to jump in and talk about how we uh, help our students become agents of change through the uh, lens of equity and inclusivity. I'll start. Um, one of the things I think we need to do is directly engage our students um, far too often. So again, I, I'm in the assessment and accreditation space, uh, dealing with both institutional accreditors and programmatic accreditors. Far too often, the um, accepted response and typical response, people say, is Oh, well, we do student surveys and we do course evaluations. So we are engaging and soliciting feedback from students on how to better their learning environment. That's not enough. Um, I, I always say, especially because the current student today, the 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 average student is an adult working student. So it's very much can be anyone on this phone call. And I'd say to you, like, how would you feel if your institution and your boss was going to make changes to your work environment and all they did was survey you and likely didn't share the results back with you or talk to you or explain things to you, uh, you'd say that's not enough, right? You'd say you're not being heard. You're not being opportunity enough opportunity to, to engage. Um, that's exactly what we're doing to our students just about everywhere is we are not truly engaging them. We are not truly inviting them into these conversations when we're making decisions um, so it, it's even harder than to, for them to enact any type of agency they may have, because again, as we talked about, they're having to navigate in an unfamiliar environment. Uh, then we're not letting them in the door <laughs> to, to the conversations where we're having the meetings, making decisions. Um, and so, uh, you know, I say this all the time, especially with assessment, we need to make sure that we are not just having students be the subjects of our study. They need to be active collaborators and co-creators in their learning environment. There is nobody more invested in their success and in their learning environment than the student. And yet, I, I, you know, majority of people on this phone call, you would probably admit at your institutions and in, 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 in your spaces, students are rarely the key population for which we are talking to, uh, or, or the, they're certainly the, the least frequent population we're talking to when it comes to their well-being, changes we need to make, um, and, and even advocating for them and giving them spaces and avenues and coaching them on how to navigate these environments that we're in in order to see the results they want to see. Um, so my big thing is we need to do a much better job engaging, truly engaging, and inviting our students for their feedback um, in, in trying to move forward to best create their learning environment. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. Uh, let's go to Garrick and then Becca. I'll, I'll springboard from where Joe said student engagement, because I believe student engagement is so valuable because then they have an intrinsic self-motivation to want to participate. So as an instructor, how do you do that? And so really that's where I think using things like universal design for learning. So 
it creates an equitable access point for students because they don't have to conform to me saying, write a four page paper. If you do not write it in these criteria, it's guaranteed F, simple as that, do as I say. Uh, by universally designing that, if you wanna write a four page paper because you love writing, please do that. If you wanna record a five minute video about this, love it. If you want to do a PowerPoint presentation for the class about this assignment, even better. All of them are going to be graded equally, but then the student has some autonomy to, to choose their own learning adventure. And again, back to Joe's point, that increases engagement because they don't have to conform to my ideals for how I believe they should learn best. I'm giving them the autonomy to choose how they believe they can learn best. And I think that creates a more equitable uh, classroom as a whole and engages the students more. Great. So, so far we've heard authentic engagement uh, through universal design, which Garrett's contribution to that. Um, after Joe kind of set the foundation with authentic engagement, let's go to Becca. So I completely agree with Joe as well. Um, literally every meeting that I have, but I'm going to add one extra bit, is I don't need people complaining. I need solution-based conversations. So if I'm having somebody that has an issue with a process, with a change, with a decision, anything, I'm totally open to adjusting it and, and going a different direction if you have a solution that's going to work for the group. So instead of coming with a negative attitude, come with a constructive, positive solution that's going to be thoughtful and inclusive for everybody. So that's something that I drive home literally weekly with my team to make sure that they understand that they're in an environment that they can affect, but I'm, I'm not taking um, complaints, I'm taking solutions only. Great, so being solution-minded, solution-focused, Aaron. I guess I interpreted this question a little bit differently and um, wanted to talk about faculty responsibility for including elements of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our courses, because I think that's where it has to be. Um, speaking for the business discipline, we've done a terrible job of preparing future leaders to have discussions of diversity, equity, inclusion, belongingness, um, at least historically. So in the CDE program we're developing, um, I've got some control because we're defining a very specific pathway through coursework um, that all students will go through in a specific order. And so in the very early beginnings of the program, they, the students will complete their ethnic studies requirement. And so for us, that's a class called um, Race um, and Relations in America, Race and Ethnic Relations in America. So the intention is that we provide the learners with the language that they need to have these discussions. And then we have the discussions in multiple locations throughout the rest of the curriculum intentionally. So it's not a single chapter. And this was a management book that was used before I got into the department. You looked at diversity and it was one little section in a chapter about HR. And in the index, when you looked up um, equity, it said see diversity. So it's just, it was embarrassing to me that uh, my discipline has just failed so radically here. And therefore um, we need to intentionally be building in education about his, what past historical inequities, um, making students comfortable with the language of diversity, equity, inclusion, and then actually practicing those conversations in our classrooms mm -hmm. so that when they get into the workplace, they are much more comfortable and prepared minimally to have the conversations, but ideally, to lead transformative change in their organizations. Thank you for bringing it back, back to a curriculum and classroom practice. Now let's go to the, the mentor who none of us are seeking for life work balance, Natasha. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. Yes, this is true. I'm happy to chat with you at any hour. Um, so so uh, I, I think I love all of this conversation and I think these are all wonderfully excellent points and are definitely um, things that we should think about. And so I wanna say yes and um, <laughs> to, to some of this where, I also think that we there is more comfort level to invite students to be part of the solution, but not to redefine what the problem is. And we need to do both if we're really going to get to DEI and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Apologize, my higher ed acronyms. Um, and some of this is 
we could say, I see this all the time, particularly with like high impact practices. We need more students to participate in internships, let's say. So how do we get more students to do internships? Now let's go to students and ask them, students, how do we get you to do more internships? And they're like, that's not the problem, I'm working. How come you can't get my work to count as an internship? And we're like, oh, thank you for telling us. That's a different problem. Let's go and figure out you know, what, what we might do with that. And so I definitely think for us as institutions, we need to be thinking about when and where and all of the opportun opportunity spaces we can engage with our students, um, that it's not just solutions, but also do they need to redefine for us the problems um, and that we're solving for the wrong sorts of problems in there. Um, I also love the idea too of multiple ways to go about assessing. I think that's incredibly important. Erin also brought that up before of having that, but we also need multiple answers and we need to model that for our students. We are very trained in, in a lot of our disciplines to get to the answer. And in most of the things that we need in work, I need many options. I need, this might work, this is not. I need another thing to turn to if this doesn't in that space. And so having a situation with our assignments as faculty when we say, okay, great, we got there. Now come back next week and tell me why we're wrong or what we didn't think about or what we didn't consider and where we needed to have different um, viewpoints and, and perspectives in this to, to have a different way. We don't practice that. We're like, great, you did it, you solved it, moved on next piece and getting into some more of that iterative nature of these conversations go talk to someone what did we miss how did we not see that come back and um, engage in that dialogue for new solutions again not just um, I want to echo like there's a point to be like here's all the things you complain about but then we need to move um, there's a really interesting study side note that was done of faculty committee meetings and on average it's seven to eight minutes of complaints before they move to solutions they get there it's just not fast enough for administrators <laughs> so on the, on the timeline. So anyway, random thing. But I think um, the more that we can engage in some of those activities, get into that dialogue, practice that opportunity for our students, the better, and think about the impact of our policies. So Joe was talking about sort of how students experience a variety of different things. And during the pandemic, faculty evaluations for course evaluations, and of course, we paused. We're like, we're not going to use this data against you as faculty because of all these changes that are happening. And instead of going students, the things that you're doing in your courses right now, we're not going to use this data against you because of all these things that are happening. We didn't mirror that for our students. We were like, sit in front of a locked browser screen. Don't you dare blank or sneeze or have a cat or <laughs> like anything because you're gonna fail instantly. Ha ha, welcome to your learning experience. Like that's horrifying. And so understanding too, are we creating environments for learning or locking that down um, are really important to engage in this because we can't say you're a part of change, but don't move <laughs> while you're part of that. They won't believe us and they won't participate um, and they'll do it elsewhere where we're not looking. Um, and I think that we need to, to provide a lot of opportunity and spaces where we're really thinking about the choices that we make. How does it advance our students toward these goals that we want in these questions, or how does it hinder their movement towards that? So much. Anyone else like to jump in? I feel like we've heard a lot of great things about, you know, fundamentally, let's have sincere engagement with our students. And just from there, every other panelist took it to a very concrete place about how we actually do that. So I appreciate that very, very much. Um, if there's nothing further on this topic, we might be prepared to go ahead and go to the next. Yeah, I think so I think I'll, I'll move it to uh, Michelle, who I think uh, has our next quote in our next slide. Thanks. Did someone from, um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right, so our kickoff quote uh, from the Microsoft CEO. Success can cause people to unlearn the habits that made them successful in the first place. And this is probably very poignant in uh, today's world where things are changing so quickly, especially regarding technology, which is what we want to turn to now. So thinking about um, technology and digital literacy in the workplace, um, how can higher education meet those needs um, for students in terms of uh, developing our curriculum and helping students learn what they need and what I'm kind of combining these two questions, the first two together. What are the standout skills, uh, those digital skills that you all, especially those in the work, uh, in the workplace, 
think are like the key ones that students really need to uh, to learn and to master and then how higher education can support that through our curriculum and what we're doing um, to prepare them for the workforce. I'm going to nominate Victoria right off the bat for this based on AI, uh, because it, it is no secret right now that this is probably the hottest topic uh, besides everything we're talking about right. uh, in, in higher education currently. And so, Victoria, are you willing to uh, kind of take a take a, a first take at it? Yeah, I'm happy to oblige. Thanks, Garrick, for the nomination. Um, certainly for from the perspective of you know building in AI and having done research in this space, it's definitely a very unprecedented time um, in this this new kind of brave new world of AI. And a lot of the, I think Garrick, to your point earlier, you know, a lot of like 15 years ago, this wasn't on anyone's minds. Even just a few years ago, um, this wasn't on a lot of people's minds. But at the same time, from a technologist's perspective, a lot of the underlying tech has been here for several years, if not decades. Um, and so a lot of times from the employer side, when we're evaluating for these skills, it comes from back to first principles of what are the these durable and tangible skills that you've already learned through other kinds of disciplines, whether you're coming from mathematics, statistics, computer science theory, whatever that is, a lot of these are transferable. And it's about learning among all your skill sets, which are the ones that you can transfer and how to go about transferring them. Um, and so I think a lot of the, the thinking around that is you can't prepare there is no kind of script to prepare or a checklist to prepare for the next hot job of, you know, of the next five, 10 years. Um, but what you can be prepared for is the fundamental skills. Um, and from a software engineering perspective, that's, that's really computer science fundamentals. It's less about, do you know this particular algorithm or this particular fine tuning mechanism? And more about, do you understand what classical machine learning is? Um, and these really deeply fundamental concepts. Thank you, Eric, please jump in. <laughs> Thank you for that, Victoria. Uh, what I'd like to add to that is I think as uh, educators across the board, uh, we need to be really intentional and careful with choosing technologies. And I say that because 10, 15 years ago, something, uh, a software that would lock down your browser did have an impact because you didn't have a cell phone sitting next to you, or you didn't have a textbook next to you. And that day and age has uh, long been gone. And so students, even though you're, you're choosing to lock them down, this relates to the last one with equity, the students spend so much time with the barrier to download the software, to run it on their computer. Oh, it doesn't actually run on this computer. Now you need to go to IT support and we have to troubleshoot there. And so I think it creates these additional barriers. And so uh, I think we're we're lying to ourselves and giving a, a false sense of hope that cheating isn't happening if I'm using a lockdown browser, because really there are other tools next to the student that they can utilize. And so I think really then it's about how do we change our learning outcomes or assessments for learning um, to really be more reactive to the, the student journey and having an open conversation about, I understand that you can Google all of this in four seconds. Here's how I'm making this learning authentic to you. So therefore you can engage in a way that um, isn't something that you're just going to Google because you will be able to Google it. Well, maybe for the next five years before the next version of Google becomes the, the common name that we all use. Uh, so I think it's just really important that we don't select technologies that we think are really great. We have to, to think bigger on how this impacts our students. Thank you. Natasha, thanks. I was gonna say there was a, I love the thinking about the, how many, what's the tech we use for our students as well. So there was a study, I think it was done in Canada, that they looked at these three institutions and they asked students in them, how many logins to different software and tech do you have across your courses? And it was insane. Like it was, I wouldn't remember for what course I needed to go where or do this. And like, if we're asking our students to engage in like things that are not consistent across the board and all these different ways, like that can be um, a lot. And that's an important thing I think to, to think about here. And it was also interesting because they were having this conversation in the same um, group of institutions on, you know, do we need to rethink our exams on why is it not open book? 
if students will be searching and looking something up if they don't know? And is it a matter of there's so many, so I think that compromise place that they got to is they have so many things that you have to do that there's no way to complete in the time that you have, you Google each thing to answer it. So some stuff you would need to know to be able to do it. You need to have enough to like get through, but you had time if you're like, I don't remember that, or I didn't read that thoroughly on something and I need to do a check where you could kind of check your knowledge, which is more how you'd be engaging with technology throughout. And so are we assessing in ways that people would be doing in work? Um, to, to back to Aaron's point before, I think it's an important one to consider. And I hope one that comes out of the technology conversation. But in terms of learning outcomes, I think there are several that we really need to elevate and engage more in our curriculum, in our work with students on information literacy. And by that, I mean, can you filter the mass amount of information that is available to you through all of your technology things? Like if I can go online and I can look a bunch of stuff up, which of it's any good? to help me with this current situation, with this consumer that I'm engaging in to problem solve right now? And can I do that quickly and efficiently so I can like get to the solution I need to address the situation that I have? Like that's an important skill set to engage in. And so how are we asking students to to move in into that direction? Um, I think information technology on the side of which, when do I use which technology to help me do what? Um, Sometimes there's this like, well, tech will help me with everything. And you're like, hmm. No, some things are really helpful for certain tasks and some things aren't for others and some things will be better later, but like, that's not what this is designed for. And that's a culture issue in your organization. Technology is not going to help you. Like if you adopt this tool, it's not suddenly going to make things great because the people implementing it will still be doing it like in these weird workarounds (laughs) and like causing problems. So I think in getting into, you know, do you know when to look for, stay abreast of different advancements in technology and then think about how does this help make my work easier? What kind of things can I offload? What, um, where, where can this best be optimized in that engagement? And then we still have huge amounts of just digital literacy problems. Like if you think back to the start of the pandemic when we were like, students can't get Wi-Fi, and they don't have laptops, and they don't know how to log into these things. And now we're like, everyone's using AI. And you're like, do they? Are they like, are they really using generative AI when they were in a parking lot trying to get your Wi-Fi? Like, let's engage again some students in these conversations and figure out how do we not create a wider technology divide for students that are savvy and using this and others that aren't. And then, of course, ethical use. If you're doing stuff, how do you talk about it and tell? Um, and, And what does that look like? And how can we model that? So those would be my top picks for learning outcome related pieces to think about. Thank you. That is like tons, <laughs> tons that you threw out there. Becca, please <laughs> jump on in. So I think Natasha nailed it. And I think the biggest piece is digital competency. I come from an industry where it we, we are changing um, different mandates and different guidelines from three different servicers that we have to figure out, okay, we're switching over to Fannie, then we're going over to Friday. Now we got to go to FHA. there's no, it's impossible. It is impossible to memorize every single one of those guidelines, every single one of those things, not only because of the mass of it, but literally how often it changes to stay relevant. So I don't look for anybody memorizing or knowing, I I look for the ability to look it up, the ability to be self-reliant and go through and, and what, to, to Natasha, but what tool is going to get there the fastest? So if I'm having somebody come in, okay, did you go to Ask Red? Did you look this up? Did you, no, you didn't? Okay, come back to me. Oh, did you go through? Did you look at the dashboard? Two, three different sets of, of logins? Absolutely. <laughs> I have a password keeper that I have to look at every single day because of the 10 different things I had to log in just to get into this computer. But it, it, it's it's so much more important that they understand how to utilize those skills and those different tools and actually use them, not just have them downloaded or available, but to be that best um, person that they can be um, for that borrower. Because, you know, there's so many that get stuck in a rut of even tools that, hey, when I came in, I used X, Y, and Z. And and those are the only things that I use because that's the only thing I know how to use. Okay, no, no, no. This is a changing time. You got to do this now. And then, oh, now, I'm sorry, six months later, now you have to do this. And, and you have to be a chameleon and be able to adapt and overcome, but it, it, it can't be stagnant with just memorizing. They have to have that, that digital workspace to continually grow. Great. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, well, please. You. Yeah, just, just to go off of Natasha's point uh, and, and, and 
some other things we've discussed is what's the environment we're trying to set, right? And what are the expectations and motivations of our students? I think we should really explore that as we think about technology, both for use cases and purpose. Um, I think especially about, I teach this open course, this MOOC with over 1500 people and they're all working professionals. It's free. And they're taking this class for their own professional development. Nobody's forcing them. They signed up for it, right? And yet I've had some students in the course say to me, you know, well, how do you know I didn't use like AI to do my do my response to this case study? I said, look, for a free PD class with 1,500 students, I'm going to grade your thing regardless of whether I think it's AI generated or not. And if that's how you are choosing to engage in your own learning environment, I really don't think you're going to get much out of it. And so kudos if you, uh, you know, fool me and get your badge for this free course by using AI. Uh, but I, I think that speaks to, again, like, what's the what are the stakes we're setting up in the environment and the ways that we're inviting students and reminding them, this is your learning. This credential, these grades, they are proxies for competency. We all know people who have degree. I go back to it. We all have people who have degrees after their name who we don't think they maybe should have earned them. <laughs> or we all know people who are in jobs who we don't know how they got that job. Let's not perpetuate that, right? Like, let's remind people this is this is your learning environment. This is your place to make mistakes. This is your place to ask questions and push yourself because, you know, here there's some safety net. You know, when you're in your job and you mess up, you, you may get fired. <laughs> And, you know, there's no financial aid supporting you there. So um, I think when it comes to these conversations, I think we also have to remember the stakes we're setting and the parameters we're enforcing, the ways we're inviting students to be authentic and, and make the most of the experience and, and you know, have a little bit of that honesty of like, if you're going to cut corners, you're going to cut corners, right? There's only so much I can do to stop that, regardless of the technology, regardless of anything else. I mean, if you start a program, like if I join a program right now and, you know, my wife does all of my homework and writes all my papers, my faculty will only know her voice, but they'll think it's my voice. And if my wife is willing to do that, then she will have earned a degree for me, right? So, so it's like people can do that even before AI. And so now AI is just an easier way to do that. But is that really what we should be inviting our students to do and, and can we call our students to have a more meaningful um, learning experience? Thank you, Joe. Natasha, please. Yeah, I was gonna say, as a higher ed, if we focus on stopping students, this is like when we were like, don't bring a cell phone to my class. Don't you dare. You keep your laptop out of my lecture hall. Like, are you freaking kidding me? And now we're like, bring your phone and click on this. And bring your laptop to take your notes. And it's the same thing. If we focus on saying, how can we block you from using a tool you're going to use in your work? Like, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. That is, that is not helpful. And you have to remember with AI, this is the worst it's going to be. Like, it's the least amount of stuff it can do. It's going to get better. That's part of learning <laughs> and the, the models that are coming out of this. And so there are certain things right now that are like, mm, not really great for that, but that will improve. And so there's no way that we can really write policies to block. So how can we say, look, do this assignment with AI, like engage in this task, do this, come back and see what kind of output did you get? How did you write a prompt that got you what you were looking for? Um, how did you, how much time did you have to spend editing? Like, did it, was it helpful in these different ways? Like, where can you use this in your education? And so if we can think about where does it make sense to engage in some of these, because our biggest problem has been generative AI around writing assignments. And that has drowned out any other conversation on AI, whether it's like, audio, visual, create, like all of these other spaces where wonderfully cool things are happening. We're like, no, our academic paper, how could you? Which is going to be used in work, never, except if they work for us in higher ed. Like no employer's like, you know what? This was an APA citations. And so I refuse to accept it. Like that's not happening. That's just not happening. That's an us thing. And so if that's what we're really concerned about, that's an us problem that we need to look at ourselves and think about. But it also puts academic integrity over learning. So I want to throw a link in to a framework that I think is very helpful. 
um, this paper has a framework in it of all the things that we can think about as we engage in technology with our students so that we don't just kind of get um, academic integrity overcoming other things that are really important to learning and um, can maybe help us back off from our knee-jerk reaction in higher ed to create policies to stop something from coming into our classroom instead of thinking about how can I embed this in my assignments to teach students how to use this effectively, meaningfully, and well. Um, that is my minor soapbox. I apologize. Thank you. And thanks for the link too. Um, Becca, if you'll uh, wrap us up with the final comment on this so that we can then do our overall wrap up, please. Yeah, I just wanted to agree with Joe that authentic voice is key. Um, that's exactly it. Uh, I've had a ton of resumes come in where it was obviously run through AI um, and introduction letters. Again, I get it. You're going to that's going to be your best representation. You should have helped with those. Those should be great. But if I'm sitting down with an interview and I'm talking to a person that is obviously not the person that even participated in that letter, um, that is worthless to me. And I feel like I was lied to because I don't know their voice. I don't know who they are. And if I can't match that up and, and, and you can't have every single email and every single presentation, you don't have the time to, to run that through and have that created. So you have to be able to have your own authentic voice that, that is real, that you can back up, that you can pick up the phone and, and be that person that you're presenting in, in a real life or else you're going to have no integrity and, and nobody's going to trust the real words that are coming out of your mouth because they're not yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Such a great point. So authentic learning, authentic voices and and, and showing up. And um, I was thinking too, just as a final piece, when Joe was talking that old adage that, you know, if you cheat, you're really only cheating yourself. So <laughs> Yark, I'll turn it over to you for our, uh, our final wrap up. Thanks. Thank you all. All right. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. What can I say? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I listened, I participated in the chat and, 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 and it's just, just, just tremendous, tremendous experience. I'm, I'm just so very grateful. Thank you very much for sharing all this. I, I, I'm, I'm getting a lot of compliments for the, for the session. So it's, it's just been great. Uh, if you could please, uh, we, we have, I don't know about, let's just say five minutes each, each one of you, if you could please, um, uh, share share something about the again about the future we um at friday slo talks uh, uh pride ourselves and this is a uh, one of the um comments that we have received um, a few years back uh thanks to friday slo talks i know what to do monday morning is there is there something a a a, a, a brilliant thought a, a, a tagline and and a, a piece of advice or you shall do this you know you 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 name it uh, from your perspective, considering this discussion, where do we go from here? Uh, uh, Joe, we can start with you so that others can, you know, think about it. <clears throat> sure. Uh, one thing that um, is tied to this, but also beyond this, and, and, and it's a good opportunity to put it on people's radars, <laughs> is um, th thinking about what are perceived as potential unfamiliar threats and thinking of them instead as opportunities. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a good way to look at the the AI component. But my my parting note along that vein is there are a whole host of um, federal regulations that are going to be going into place in the month of July that uh, gainful employment, administrative capacity, um, state licensure related disclosures and ability to operate in states where you don't meet those versus not. And there's a lot of institutions freaking out about that stuff right now. Um, I smile, even though I'm having to handle that freak out at my institution. I smile, though, because there are things that are going to be great for students. They're going to increase transparency. They're going to um, hold institutions a little more accountable to to uh, earnings. Right. And, and hopefully, too, in conjunction, help elevate low paying industries. Right. Because schools can only cut their costs so much. And if an industry just pays people low money, the, the industry needs to respond to. And I hope uh, Department of Labor <laughs> puts something in place. It's not just Department of Ed holding institutions accountable for for uh, helping set people up for success. But I, I just want to, again, call out that while that's um, concerning and institutions are worried about what that's going to mean for marketing and uh, all that, that there's a really great opportunity for us to lean in and um, think about the good we're going to be doing for students with more of that transparency and how it's going to give us a new lens to look at our operations 
again with the student at the center instead of um, the students as the afterthought. Uh, so uh, that that's my note. And just my, my current theme is I think we're going to have to break things and potentially enter into a darker space <laughs> of higher ed in order to come out on the better side uh, with wow. a better designed environment for students. Definitely a change, change, change is coming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, Erin, do you mind uh, following up on this? Uh, not at all. There's, I have a couple of different paths I could go down here, but where I think I want to go, um, because you wanted it to be a useful tool, is to challenge my faculty colleagues to relook at your student learning outcomes, determine if they're truly doing and demonstrating, and if not, figuring out how to do that, and then evaluating your your assessments and moving mm -hmm. towards authentic assessments. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir with this particular audience. But um, so if you're already there, then consider multiple ways a learner could demonstrate that they can do something. Um, so giving them some choice in how they do an assignment to master a, a competency. Right on, competency it is. Uh, Becca, please, if you don't mind. Um. I just want to thank everybody for letting me participate. Um, this has been very exciting. I feel bad in some cases that I'm just bringing up instances, but not actually knowing how to um, integrate that into education since that's not my field. But um, hopefully it, I was able to at least add some insight. Um, probably the biggest thing I would say taking away from this is to keep encouraging those students to be uh, their own authentic self and to stand out because there is so many, so many people out there in the job market um, coming out with different sets of degrees and masters that, that need to stand out. And um, those micro uh, degrees sounds like an awesome option. I'm sorry, there's a dog going crazy, but um, just to keep an open mind and continue growth in their education. Right on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Garrick, please. We talked a lot about a lot of different problems today. We also talked about a lot of solutions. So I would challenge everyone to take your problem that you're thinking of and try to apply a solution because we are all on the same team together in this work, whether it's industry, whether it's higher ed, uh, whether it's education in general. And so really, what are our solutions to some of our problems? And so let's look for those solutions and work on those. As Natasha said, we spend a lot of time just talking about the problems, which there is health in that, but there is also great health in talking about solutions. With those solutions being willing to fail forward, it's okay to fail. It's all right. And we need to recognize that and accept that uh, and move on from those. So thank you all. Uh, this has been excellent. And the chat has been one of the uh, best that I've seen in a, a discussion like this in a long time. It was really enjoyable reading uh, all the, the tidbits that were in there. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, Victoria, please. Thank you. I honestly just learned a ton from my fellow panelists, especially from the educators um, perspective and Becca from a different industry's perspective as well. And I think for me, the, the big takeaway or the, the name, the kind of name of the game is adaptation. And it's how quickly can we have students be adapted, but also from the employer side, taking that look in the mirror and saying, what are the ways we can adapt to better meet students and graduates where they are in that higher education pipeline. Um, and so for, for me, it's really kind of taking all of these lessons and thinking about how can we translate that into our practices in a company and then also, you know, paying that forward into what it means for that field of, of AI and technology too. So thank you all just so much, um, really for having me and just for sharing all of your wise insights. Really appreciate it. Right on. Thank you so much. Thanks to, for joining us. And Natasha, if you could please um, close it up for us. Sure. So thank you so much. This has been a wonderfully wide ranging and fabulous conversation. Delighted to be in partnership with the panelists and all of you. So thank you so much for that opportunity. Um, I think for me, the takeaway that I want to kind of echo from a lot of these is there's a lot of challenge and there's a lot of noise. And so as we think about how do we want to create the future space that we want for our students, for ourselves, and all of this. Remember, for those of us at all points in time, like even in employers, 
we're educators. We're trying to get people to do things. We're trying to help them understand how to do it. And we wouldn't be doing this work if we didn't care. Um, and fundamentally, that is a place that we have commonality. So proceed with confidence. And we will not solve this without each other. And so don't go into this alone. What is that thing from the video game? Like, uh, hold on, take this, you'll need it. Like we need each other <laughs> to get forward and advance and do this. And so keeping students at the center, yes, but working with our employer partners, engaging with those around us in community um, will make all of this uh, doable and, um, and scalable in really positive ways. So thank you for your time. Right on. Thanks, everyone. That's what we are all about, building community and making sure that we network, we support each other. That's that's it. We are all in it together. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of announcements, just that uh, SLO Symposium is coming up on January 26 and 27. So please uh, join us. Enrique, please, you have you something will, to say. Still. Yes, thank you. Our professional development develop, uh, coordinator, Susie Nisso, just posted also the uh, SLO Symposium. So go okay. tap in that. Thank you, Susie, uh, for that. Thank you. All right, then. Well, thanks again. Happy holidays. And we'll see you in January at the SLO Symposium. Thank you, coaches. Thank you, panelists. Until next time. Thank you all. Thank you all. all right. Thank you, Thank you.